No, that's clear. And um, how many students you have? Uh, Eight thousand two hundred. And how many? And they are all undergraduates. We have graduate program. You have a, I'm a the wife of our uh, yes. chancellor. Yes. Nice to see you. This is my son Isaac. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the gentleman uh, yeah. who's responsible for bringing our honored oh, guests. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, from, from, from Thailand. From yes. Thailand. Are you from Thailand? Thailand. Yes. Oh. You can speak as you a little bit, not too much, not too much. Tam tam ti staban technology in Asia and vice president. Gentlemen, welcome to Angeles University Foundation's Investiture Ceremonies, the conferment of the degree Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa upon Dr. Aaron J. Sitchenover, 2004 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, the processional. President, the University Trustees, 
the university chants the Lord together with honor. All please rise for the invocation to be led by Reverend Father Ramirez Capulo, University Chaplain. And please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem and Pilipinas Kumbahan to be led by the AUF Concert Chorus. Oh, no. 
university president will now give the address of petition. The Honorable Chairman and members of the Board of Trustees, university officials, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Angeles University Foundation, it is my distinct honor to petition the Board of Trustees for the conferment of the degree Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa upon Dr. Aaron J. Tichanover, 2004 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry in recognition of his academic achievements and outstanding contributions to science and medicine. Dr. Nicanor C. Austriaco, Vice President for Academic Affairs, will now do the reading of citation. May we request our honoree to please rise. And step a little forward. Angeles University Foundation, the first Catholic university in Central Luzon. In the name of God, Amen. We, the undersigned, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Chancellor, and President of Angeles University Foundation, do hereby certify that Dr. Aaron J. Sikhanover, having earned his Master of Science, summa cum laude, in 1970, and his Doctor of Medicine in 1975, from the Hadassah Medical School of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and having completed his Doctor of Science in 1981 at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology at Haifa, Israel. Having distinguished himself as a scientist extraordinary, responsible in discovering ubiquitin mediated protein degradation, which led to the development of mechanism based medications, including cancer treatment thereby earning for himself the Albert Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research, the Israel Prize for Biology, which is the highest recognition bestowed upon by the State of Israel. Also his academic awards and honorary degrees from 10 countries and the prestigious 2004 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and having demonstrated the commitment and sincere desire to serve through his brand of leadership as an educator, administrator, researcher, and scientist, whose deep sense of social responsibility and nationalism brought him back to his home country, Israel, thus leaving behind the lure of fame and fortune in the United States. And for his selfless sharing of knowledge and expertise at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, where he is presently a distinguished research professor at the Center for Cancer and Vascular Biology, and Director of the Rappaport Faculty of Medicine and Research Institute. Wherefore, in view of the foregoing and his other accomplishments, we have deemed it worthy to confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa, and in witness whereof, 
we have hereunto set our hands in the seal of the university so attested. Given in Angeles City, Philippines, this fourth day of April in the year of our Lord, 2008, and of the university, the 46th. Signed, Most Reverend Pashano B. Aniceto, Chairman of the Board, Emmanuel Y. Angeles, Chancellor, and Ricardo P. Fama, President. The approval of petition and confirmment of the degree, Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa, upon Dr. Aaron J. Sitchanover by Dr. Emmanuel Y. Angeles, University Chancellor. The Honorable Chairman and members of the Board of Trustees, University officials, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, by virtue of the authority vested in me, it is my singular pride and honor to inform Dr. Aaron J. Sitanover, 2004 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, of the unanimous decision of the Board of Trustees of Angeles University Foundation to confer upon him the degree Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa in recognition of his academic achievements and outstanding contributions to science and medicine. We shall now have the imposition of the academic hood and cap and the presentation of the University Medal of Honor and Diploma by the University Chancellor to be assisted by the University President. So again, congratulations, Dr. Sitchenover. At this juncture, I'd like to request our honorary and the university officials to please join the audience. So. Ladies and gentlemen, to give to us the statement of purpose, may we call on Mr. U.V. Morvitz, founding chairman, International Peace Foundation. Let's give him a warm applause.
Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation, under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events have been hosted with various local partners, including the countries, the major universities, and I thank Ankeles University and its Chancellor, Dr. Emmanuel Ankeles, for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2007, Bridges has been continuously held in the Philippines and Thailand until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates and other eminent keynote speakers. The first ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for culture of peace and nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 250 Bridges events which the International Peace Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand between November 2003 and April 2005. 26 Nobel laureates, as well as 12 other keynote speakers and artists, such as Dr. Hans Blix, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, and Jesse Norman participated in these events. They were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit of Thailand and Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Mahachatu Simiton and reached an audience of 70,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 75 other international and national institutions, including 23 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges in Thailand and of the events in the Philippines reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media, since peace within ourselves, our families, and the environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. A globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. Let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected, and comprehensive view of ourselves and of the world in which we live in in which we are able to create a new constantly, through dialogues, towards a culture of peace, which needs the participation of everyone. As the Philippine Bridges series comes to its close this April, and will be continued in Malaysia in November 2008, I thank Professor Aaron Chikanova, the 2004 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, who has agreed to come to the Philippines to support the events. And we now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and welcome, Professor Chikano. To do the honor of introducing our most esteemed honorary and guest lecturer, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big hand to our beloved University Chancellor, Dr. Emmanuel Y. Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very honored to have with us today someone who has distinguished himself in the field of science and medicine. I believe that this is the first time that uh, Senator Luzon 
and north of the sun, is host to a Nobel Prize winner like him. And we would like to thank Bridges and the International Peace Foundation for choosing Angeles University Foundation to be part of their first ASEAN event series. Aside from these accomplishments mentioned earlier in the citation, please uh, allow me to share with you that we have every reason to thank our guest of honor and speaker because through his discovery, it is now possible to understand at a molecular level how the cell controls a number of central processes by breaking down certain proteins and not others. This has led pharmaceutical companies to initiate efforts to develop drugs to combat cancer with many more in the pipeline. Growing up in a religious family in uh, Haifa, Israel, he has displayed a deep passion for biology at a very young age. It is very heartwarming to know that he attributes his immense success to his family and former mentors who provided him the support and inspiration to pursue what he has liked doing best. A medical doctor by profession, a multi-awarded uh, researcher, scientist, educator, and author of over a hundred scholarly papers, he has proven that fulfillment is achieved not by much by material wealth, but by sharing one's gift of knowledge through education. Truly a rare gem and gift to the modern world. Please welcome the latest addition to the AUM alumni, 2004 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, Dr. Aaron J. Chichanover. Science to help by creating new knowledge 
to resolve these problems. And therefore, for me, a university is in many ways a temple, a holy place, where we should cherish creation of new knowledge. And therefore, I'm so thankful for this Angeles, for the Angeles universities for bestowing upon me this honor. What I want to do with you today is not telling you much about science. I will tell you a little bit about our science. But rather, if I had to choose a title, a different title to my talk, I would have said that what I want to do for you and with you today is to deconvolute the mystique of the Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize is kind of a metaphor, and uh, people wonder about it. What is it about this prize that took it so far? And they, from time to time, look at Nobel laureates as very strange creatures. But at the end, the Nobel laureates are human beings, like everybody. They are not any different. They are not immortal. They are human beings like anybody else. And they made a discovery in their appropriate, proper universities or institutes. And these discoveries added yet another brick of knowledge to our understanding on which we are able to build uh, even more. So there is nothing mystic about it, but I think that if we go and deconvolute it into small components, I think that you will see that it's rather simple. And it's rather simple, not in the sense to get a Nobel Prize, because I think that the purpose in life is not to get a Nobel Prize or any prize. The purpose in life is to excel. The purpose in life is to contribute to society. The purpose in life is to be a good citizen of your own nation and to have an impact on what you are doing. And it doesn't matter whether you are a teacher in a small village. You have an impact on 30 children that get a very good education from you, you had an impact. So the Nobel Prize in that sense is not very much different, except that it has an impact maybe on more people, but the principle has remained the very same. So I think that what I want to do is to tell you a little bit of my own history that's reflected via the history of my family, the history of my country, uh, of which I am a very proud uh, citizen for all my life, and then tell you a little bit on our own discovery and how did it contribute to human health and what people are doing with it. Because the, our discovery, though it came out from the laboratory out of a theoretical curiosity, ended up with understanding basic mechanisms of human disease, actually is the most, uh, the, maybe the number one or number two killer of modern medicine, of modern civilization, which is cancer. And not only understanding mechanisms, but also developing cures to this disease. And we are still only at the beginning of the road. We are seeing hardly the tip of the iceberg. So let's devote the next 40 minutes or so, and we'll try very quickly to run a marathon over I would say my own life, I didn't come to tell you my biography, Let's, uh, but I, I came, I think that it can be useful to have some lessons learned from it. So I was born in Israel in 47, the same year that the country was established. Actually this year we are celebrating our 60th anniversary. And uh, my parents immigrated to Israel from Poland before the Holocaust in Europe, so they were spared from this uh, unbelievable, cruel extermination of six million Jews in Europe by the Germans. And uh, we were a blue-collar family, just barely floating. My father was a clerk and then a lawyer. My mother was an English teacher. And what I remember from home is an unbelievable push for studies just learning, my father was sitting with me, going over my homework, and while we didn't have much food at home, we were drowning in an ocean of books. <laughs> so, books were first priority, my father kept on buying used books all the time, and I was pushed very hard. 
So I went through elementary education and then high education in a relatively young country that has never seen until this day one day of peace. During my lifetime, I have undergone 11 wars, 11 real wars. Part of them I participated actively as an officer in the military. I'm a military physician, a combat physician in the Israeli Defense Forces. I'm a major in the Israeli Defense Forces. And the last war was just last uh, summer, in the summer of 2006. Our city was bombarded heavily by missiles. The medical school in which I am there, and I went there daily, was bombarded daily by missiles. Luckily, we were not hurt, but missiles were falling in a diameter of a few hundred meters around us. And nevertheless, this country managed to push itself and to propel itself to the highest uh, possible level um, of development. And again, I hate to use the Nobel Prize as, as a metaphor, but uh, the State of Israel was lucky or to produce about five what I call true Nobel laureates in sciences, literature, and economy. Not to say other, other prizes. And we have unbelievable high uh, quality universities and education system industry. We are exporting billions of dollars of high tech and biotech a year. And we have converted the country in less than six years from the farmland into a country that exports basically only high tech and biotech. So I graduated in high school in the country and then went to study. In Israel, um, as you know or don't, uh, at the age of 18, everybody has to go to the military for three years, men for three years, women for about a year and a half, to serve in the military. But the military allows people to postpone their service and first to go to study, and then the military is using these professionals for their own purposes. So that's the way that the military can have military physicians, and military engineers, and lawyers, and teachers, and whatever they need. By allowing people first to go and study, and then come and serve, I picked up this opportunity and went to the medical school in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to study medicine. I wasn't sure about medicine. I didn't know what it is, but medicine has been for centuries, for generations, the dream of Jewish mothers. They wanted the kids to be doctors. And uh, so I followed the, what I saw at home, the pressure to become a doctor. So I went to the medical school, but then I realized after four years that I, it's actually not what I really want to do in life. And then I made a decision to change. And I stopped my medical studies, and I decided to take a master's degree in sciences, in biochemistry. And so I left my class, went to do my master's degree, and realized that that's exactly what I want to do for life. I want to be a scientist. But then I had an obligation to my country. My country sent me to medical school not to become a scientist, but to become a physician. And I wanted to serve as a military physician, so I went back to medical school, took another three years and graduated the medical school. In Israel, the medical education system is a little bit different than in the Philippines. It's seven years as one block in the medical school. So I finished medical school and went to serve as a combat physician in the military. This was 1973, exactly the same time that we had an awful war that almost wiped out the country, and I was drafted directly from the medical school into the military, into this horrendous war. I served for three years as a naval physician, and then in another unit, and then I fulfilled, completed my uh, national service and was on to my civilian life. So let's make a little bit of a stop here and tell you what is the lesson. The lesson here has to do mostly with the year that I took to do sciences. We are living now in an era, at least in the West, I hope not in the Philippines yet, but I assume that you are also infected with this uh, American and European diseases. And the people are rushing. People are rushing to developing careers, to making money, 
to the high tech to become lawyers and accountants and whatever they want to do, and they don't stop for a minute to think about whether they like it, whether that's what they want to do. And what happens these days is that we are living long enough. The average lifetime span of life in many countries, including the Philippines, has extended in the last century to almost 80 years. People are living almost 80 years. And we have enough time to fulfill many of our dreams. So if you think you made a mistake and you became lawyers or you started something that you don't like to do, just don't stick to it. Stop it and do something else that you like to do. I think it's more important in life to be happy than to be rich or to stick to something that your parents or your wife or your somebody wants you to do. And it took me a lot of hesitation to learn it that I don't like medicine and I want to do something else and I at least want to try something else. And we live, as I said, long enough in order to make all these trials. Life, after all, is a collection of experiences. It's not something that we are planned like robots to walk in a certain track. We just collect experiences. We travel all over the world. We learn on our car. We learn on different cultures. We learn to know other people, other religions. We are living in a very rich society, and we just collect experiences. So we don't have to look at life as, as something that is planned for us, and we must follow it. We just can change it at our will. So I finished my military service, and then still was a little bit deliberating of what to do, and I decided that I'm not sure, and I took a little bit of training in surgery. So I tried surgery a little bit. I wasn't sure whether I still want medicine or I want to be in science. So I experienced quite an exciting experience in the operating theater. But then I nevertheless decided that I would like to be a scientist. So I started all over again. I went to a graduate school. I started my PhD for five years. So though I had already one doctorate in medicine, I decided that I don't want it. I put it aside and I want to become a scientist. I had the great support of my wife. We were married at that time. Once you're married, you have family obligations. You think about life, about uh, bringing up children, about making your monthly salary. But then I thought, no, I want to become a student again. But I want to do something that I want to do. And I went to graduate school in the Technion. And there I met my teacher, Avram Hershko, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize later and during the next five years, between 76 and 81, we discovered the ubiquitin system that I will tell you about it a bit later. I graduated, I got my PhD, and then decided that I need to expand further. It's not enough to get a PhD. And I went to do a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the United States one of the finest uh, institutes in the world. It has probably the strongest department of biology in the world, and I worked there with one of the best biologists in this century, with Harvey Lodish, and I completed the four years, almost a four years period of postdoctoral fellowship. And then we faced another decision, what to do, where to pursue the career, and the question was whether to stay in the United States. You had much more American experience than I had. Americans were here. They conquered this country from the Spanish, and then they were sitting here for decades. And the American influence on this country is immense. And you know all that America is very tempting as an idea, as a society, as a democracy, as a symbol of freedom. And I was tempted very much to stay in the United States, had many offers to be there. Actually, now I have even more offers to go there. But after many deliberations, I decided to go back uh, to Israel. And as I told you, Israel is a tiny, small country of less than 7 million people involved in war for, from day one. But I thought to myself that there are several reasons why I prefer Israel and the United States. One reason is obviously family and culture. People who want to be in their home. They want to speak their language. They want to hear their songs. They want to be with the family and with the friends. And that's a very heavy reason to go back. 
Another reason that I wanted to go back is that I felt that in Israel I can have a much higher and stronger impact on society than I can have in America. In America, you are drowning in an ocean of 300 million people. And it's very hard to be an exception. I didn't want to be an exception, but I had many ideas about education and about science, and I thought that in Israel I could have an impact, which is true. I do have an impact on the society on certain aspects, especially now as a Nobel laureate, but even before. You educate people, you see, you can harvest the fruits, you can teach students, and then they come back to you. It's a small country, it's like more like a family. You know the scientific community, the country is tiny, you can cross the entire country in the longest axis in less than four hours. The entire length of the country is 400 kilometers, and the width of the country at the widest point is 70 kilometers. 70 kilometers, so it's 400 by 70 kilometers in width at the widest point. So it's a tiny, small country, and the reason, as I told you, that I go, went back has to do with culture and with impact. And I went back in 85, established my own laboratory, continued to work on the same system that I discovered, educated a generation of young scientists. And again, it turned out to be correct. Not only that they had an impact on the country, but you can win even a Nobel Prize in the country. Even if you are small, even if you are poor, even if you are detached from the big American institutes like Harvard and MIT and University of California in San Francisco and Johns Hopkins, you don't have to be in these big places. You can be in a place that you can hardly spell out the name of and nevertheless get it to the top. So it just shows you that it's all possible. And it's all possible in a very humane manner. You don't have to be a magician. You don't have to play any games that nobody knows. You are playing just simple rules. And you follow your own principles. And you can get them. So I think that this is an important uh, lesson for, for everyone. And most of the Nobel Prizes indeed were won by people that are coming from big countries. But I think that our lesson is that you can do it in a small country that is still, its very existence is not secure. I mean, I cannot know that the country will exist forever. I mean, we are still in a very danger of existence. So now let's depart from this personal uh, uh, part of the lecture and go to the science. And I'll try to simplify the science for you as much as I can, and to tell you how one can take and convert an idea in biology that nobody believes in into a multi-billion dollar drug industry that cure people from cancer and from other diseases. So the idea was to learn about how our body components are destroyed. So the body, the complex human body, like the complex body of different organisms around us, animals, dogs, cats, frogs, chicken, even old animals like the alligators, is made of proteins. And proteins are the machines on which the body is being carried. So the muscles, the bones, all our systems are made of proteins. So the proteins constitute the structure, gives us the structure, but the proteins also constitute the function. So all the digestive functions, the heart function, the brain function, the high functions of the brain, the intellect, the creativity, are all made by proteins. And uh, dependent on your religion, whether you believe in life after death or you don't, basically, once we don't stop living, once we die, we die. Our proteins are not functioning anymore and we don't create anymore. And uh, so for biologists, for simple biologists like me, life is very complex on one hand because we don't understand it. But it's very simple on the other hand because it's confined to a box that contains so many proteins that all play a symphony, which I call the symphony of life. And it plays such a wonderful symphony that it doesn't need even a conductor. These 20 or 30,000 proteins 
each knows its function and it doesn't need any instruction of when and where to do it. So we don't have to think about it. If I stand now in front of you and talk, my heart still pumps blood and my muscles are still holding me straight. I can stand, I don't fall to the left or to the right. I can, I know, I get a lot of information automatically without thinking about it. I can see you, but I don't think about it. So I know that I have to face you and not to face my back. I know exactly where my back is, because if I raise my finger, I can tell you exactly where my finger is, and I know whether it's the second finger or the third finger or the fourth finger. I have information that is going back and forth to my brain, and that's all occurring automatically. I don't think about standing uh, in front of you. So all the proteins know what they do. They don't need to ask me what to do, and they leave me to do only the very thin layer of higher function of the brain, namely intellectual activity, lecturing, making experiments in the laboratory, all the rest is occurring automatically behind me by this wonderful group of molecules called proteins. Now, until the 30s, people thought that everything in the body is stable, namely we are being born at the weight of about three kilograms as babies, and then at the age of 15 or 16, we are gaining our final weight, which is about, depends how thin or fat we are, between 50 to 80 kilograms on the average of a healthy human being, and that's it. And then from the age of 16, we go all the way to uh, aging with the same very molecules. So we are carrying the same molecules with us. And that's misleading, it turned out to be wrong. Basically, we are exchanging our molecules all the time. We are not like this computer that, has, that is, doesn't exchange. So this computer will be the same computer tomorrow and the same computer next year if we don't hurt it or don't change it. Or our cars will be the same cars and our building, the apartment that we live will be the same building. Our body is not the same. It's exchanging constantly. And when I say constantly, people imagine that we are changing along many years. So if we look at the mirror today and tomorrow, we see the same face, but it takes many years to get older and to change. But it's not true. We are changing all the time in an unbelievable way. Every day, we are replacing, we are destroying about 5 to 10% of our components and making new ones instead. So 10% of our body of proteins are being changed every day. We are in a very dynamic state. So the fact that we are exchanging ourselves so rapidly raises immediately several questions. One question is if today, which is, what is it today, the 4th of April, I am not the same person chemically that I was a month ago because every day 5 to 10 percent are being exchanged. So every molecule of protein that I have with me today, or almost every molecule, is different than the molecule that I had with me in the 4th of March. So who am I anyway if the molecules, the physical molecules, are not the same? This is not a philosophical question. This is a biological question. Because if the molecules are different, then how the memory still remains? And how the intellect and creativity and emotions still remain the same? Because if I take this computer and buy an identical computer instead of it, it will not be the same because the software and the, the knowledge of the computer is not the same in the new one. Everything that is here in this computer will not be in the new one unless I'm transferring. So how is it that in the body, despite the fact that I renew myself, I nevertheless not only remain the same but even improve? I collect new experiences during the last month. I visited new places, I came to know new people. So despite the fact that I'm changing, I remain the same and even better in myself. So this is a very important biological question that I'm not going to touch. The second question is, why are we doing it? Why the body is not stable? Why we are not like the computer? Why we have to be involved all the time in this destruction? The, the third question is, if we are exchanging, what is the mechanism that does it for us? The fourth question is, what happens if this mechanism goes wrong? And the fifth question is, well, if this mechanism goes wrong, can we cure it? Can we handle it? Like, 
if something goes wrong with our car or with the computer, can we handle it? I will not go over all these questions, certainly not in detail, I'll just give you a little bit of a glimpse into this uh, question. And uh, the first question is why, why we are doing it, why we are not stable, why we are exchanging our molecules all the time. I'll give you just two examples and then we will keep on running. I'll give you an example of a piece of meat that you are buying in the butcher. So you're going to the butcher and you're buying a piece of meat, a steak, a chicken, I don't know, a pig, whatever you like, a fish. And what you're doing, you're taking this meat and you're putting it in the freezer or the refrigerator. That's the place for it. But if you forgot to put it in the refrigerator and you left it on the table in the morning, especially in the hot uh, Manila day of May, when you come afternoon from work, this piece of meat works for nothing. It's thinking and you can throw it away. The same will happen to the milk. If you leave milk on the table for several hours, all what you can do is throw it away. The meat that you left, the steak, is exactly like my meat, like our own flesh, like our own muscles, except that it's coming from the cow, or the chicken, or the pig. So how is it that the meat that you left in your room on the kitchen at a temperature of about 25 degrees after eight hours is already bad, and our body is still keeping alive for eight years despite the fact that the temperature of the body is 37 degrees, much higher than the temperature in our home. The reason is that we are exactly like the meat. We are, this, we are spoiling our proteins all the time, but we have a mechanism in the body that takes this proteins and removes them and synthesizes, generates instead of the new ones. So we are not different than the milk or the cheese or the meat that you leave on the table, except that the milk doesn't have a life capacity. It's coming from the cow and that's it. It cannot renew itself. The meat is coming from a dead cow. And the same is true for the cheese that is made of milk. But we are living organisms. So every protein that gets spoiled and misfolded and denatured and non-functional is immediately removed and being replaced by a new one. And because we are living in such a high temperature, this process is very intense. And the same is true for oxygen in the air. You know, we need oxygen, but on the other hand, oxygen is very deleterious, it's poisonous, it oxidizes and damages our proteins, and we have to remove them. So we are removing bad proteins. And if something happens to the system and it doesn't remove the bad protein, we become very sick. And I'll talk about the sicknesses later. The other reason why we are destroying proteins is I first told you that we are destroying bad proteins that got misfolded or denatured or non-functional. The other reason that we are destroying proteins, we are destroying very good proteins that we don't need anymore. So from time to time, there is something very good, but we don't need it anymore. So for example, in the winter, we have influenza. So we are making antibodies to influenza, and we defeat the disease, but now we don't need the antibodies anymore, because we are healthy, so we destroy them. So these are very good antibodies. They can still kill the influenza virus, but we don't need them anymore, because we, don't, we are not sick, so we can destroy the antibodies. So we are destroying proteins because of two reasons because of quality control. Anyway, my laser pointer over there. Quality control, because we remove proteins that of bad quality, we don't, because they're damaging, and because we want to control processes. So once we need antibodies to influenza, we do make the antibodies. Once we don't need it, we want to control the process and we destroy them. So we answered already two questions. The first question is, we didn't answer it. And that's if we, every month we are exchanging ourselves completely, then who are we? Anyway, that we didn't answer, it's too complex. The second question is why we are destroying our proteins is the second question. Now we are left with three questions that I'll try to answer very briefly. Now we are coming to the second lesson that I want to convey to you. And that's 
what are you doing in order to become a very good scientist, especially if you are in a small country? You are outsmart your enemies. That's what you are doing. You are developing strategies that your enemies don't think about, your competitors. So I'm coming from a very small country and with very limited resources. And the, at the time that we started this study with my teacher, Abram Hershko, the entire scientific community was busy with elucidating the genetic code or how proteins are being made. Why are we human beings and why the dog is a dog and why the cat is a cat and why the turtle is a turtle? So everybody was fascinated by the genetic code and nobody cared about the structure. The structure in general is a process that people are not interested in. If you look, go in the city and you see a bulldozer destroying a home, you know that in two days there will be no home and a new one will come out. So you think that it's important. We must destroy in order to have a new one, but it's not an interesting process. So people are not interested in destruction. So we thought, aha, uh -huh, we are in a small country. Let's do something that nobody is interested in. It was very risky because we couldn't appreciate how important it is. But at least we knew that we shall have no competition. Because if you are in a small country, you don't want to compete against the rich universities uh, abroad, especially not in the United States. So this is another reason why we went into it. So there is another lesson to learn. So we discovered the system, which is called the ubiquitin system. It was mentioned here. I will not go into it, but the system fourth question, and that's what happens if the system doesn't work. Now, this is, I jump very quickly. I go to human diseases. I mean, human diseases are the thing that fascinates me more than anything else because of the complex mechanisms and because of the ability to provide help if we can. Now, proteins in the body are like any other parameter in the body. You all know, probably even if you are not in the medical field, that the, we are all the time keeping every value in our body in a very tight control. So we are, have a certain height. We are not growing to five meters, and luckily we are not also at the height of a mouse. So human beings have a height of between, I don't know, 160 centimeters, 150 centimeters, 190 centimeters, but that's the, that's the range. We have a weight. We are not weighing one kilogram, and we are not weighing 200 kilograms. We are weighing something between 50 and 80, and that's the 90, and that should be the extremes. We have a blood pressure. Everybody knows that we have a blood pressure, and the blood pressure is being kept within values of 120 over 80 millimeter of mercury, more or less. If we have more, we are hypertensive. We have a hypertension. If we have less, we are hypotensive. And the same is true for every parameter, and there are hundreds and hundreds of parameters that are being kept under tight control. Glucose and sodium and potassium and calcium and phosphate and sulfate and and, and whatever in bone density, and the parameters are not only chemical parameters, but also physiological parameters. Our heart beats about 50, 60 times in a minute. It doesn't beat 150, and it doesn't beat 10 times. And each stroke pumps out about 50 milliliters of blood, and not a liter of blood, and not a milliliter of blood. So I can go forever and tell you about numbers in the body. We are living in a very mathematical, very accurate organism, because otherwise it will be Horrendous. And the same is true for proteins. Proteins have to be kept under control. So each protein must have its own level. And if something happens and proteins are rapidly destroyed, they will go below the level, and that's bad. And if something will happen and proteins will not be degraded, they will accumulate, and that will be bad. Like any other thing, if we accumulate fat and we become fatty, that's dangerous because we develop hypertension, we develop diabetes, and we develop whatever we know, and we know that fatty people die earlier than people that keep right their weight, and so on and so forth. So proteins are not different in that respect than any other biological, physiological parameter. Now, and if we deviate, we are in a problem. So I'll show you two examples before I go to drugs. One example has to do with neurodegenerative diseases. 
Take, for example, Alzheimer's disease, which is a major problem in the West. Once you hit the age of 70 or 80, people are in a high risk to get Alzheimer's. And one problem in Alzheimer's is that people don't remove appropriate proteins from the brain. And junk proteins, garbage proteins, are accumulated. You can see here, this is the cover of the science magazine. And you can see here, by immunohistochemistry, you can see staining of proteins in the brain that have not been removed. And these patients died of Alzheimer's disease because they didn't degrade properly the proteins. So here you have a major disease, and the same is true for Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Let's go to another disease, and that's cancer. And that's what I want to tell you the most. And cancer is a very complicated disease. I'll try to simplify it for you, to tell it to you in a lay language. Cancer is a tumor. It's rapid division, uncontrolled division of cells. And it's again deviation from the normal mathematics. The cells are dividing rapidly and generate tumor. The tumor is space occupying and it disturbs the function of the tissues around it. The tumor also sends metastasis, so a tumor can start in the intestine and then it can go to the lung and it can go to the liver and it can go it can start in the lung and then it can go to the to the brain and then it destroys the tissue in which it settles, and it's horrendous disease. Now, cancer, by nature, is a very interesting disease for research. And basically, there is all the time a balance in, inside normal cells. And while you're sitting here in the audience and looking or listening to me, or just getting bored by what I'm telling you, whatever everybody feels, and you are developing every minute millions of cancer cells. So it's frightening that while you are sitting here and think that you are healthy, and you are healthy, you are nevertheless developing millions of cancer cells. But the body has a detection mechanism that will eliminate these cells all the time. So once the cancer, a mutant cell is developed, it's immediately eradicated by the body. The body has a very high quality control mechanism to eradicate cancer. And this mechanism is called tumor suppression. It suppresses tumors. Now, the tumor suppression mechanism is made of proteins. It's made of proteins. Everything in the body is made of proteins. As I told you, once the proteins don't function, we are either become sick or are dying. Actually, if you think about fever, if you think of fever, you realize that our body temperature is 37 degrees. We have a very narrow range of life, up to 42. But in 40 or 39, we are already very sick, centigrade. And at 42 degrees, we are dying. We are dying because proteins at this high temperature become non-functional. They become like cooked eggs. Think about it. What we are doing in order to cook egg or to fry it, we put it in high temperature. We either boil it in water or we put it in boiling oil. So that's exactly what we are doing to our proteins at 42 degrees. We are cooking them. And once we cook them, and they become non-functional, we cannot take them back. So a certain point comes that we cannot take them back. So you can cook an egg, but you cannot take the cooked egg and make it a raw egg again. It can go only one direction. You never thought of it, but if you think of it, you'll see that it's a very simple phenomenon, but it's right. Try to take a fried egg and bring it back to the shell. It's a raw egg. You will not do it. Because the proteins have been denatured and it's folded irreversibly. And that's what happens to us at 42 degrees. We are crossing the point and we cannot go back anymore. And therefore we die. It's all because of our problem. Now, these tumor suppressors that are the proteins are all the time taking care of us. They suppress the tumors. They don't let cancer evolve. If something happens, and these tumor suppressors will be degraded rapidly. They will be removed by mistake by the body. There will be no tumor suppressors. And all these millions of cancer cells will celebrate now because there will be nobody to eradicate them. And therefore, we shall develop cancer. And there are many cancers that are developing due to misfunction of tumor suppressors. So I can give you, I can give you one example, and that's a cancer of women. It's the uterine cervical carcinoma that is being caused by a virus called the human papilloma virus. And the human papilloma virus devised the mechanism 
by which it removes a tumor suppressor. It leads the system that we discovered to think that the tumor suppressor, which is basically a very good and important protein, is a bad protein. It changes it somehow. So the human body, the cervix of the uterus, removes the tumor suppressor and by this exposes the epithelium, the lining of the uterus of the woman, to malignant transformation, to cancer. So if we excessively degrade tumor suppressor, we are succumbing to cancer. Now let's look at the opposite. There are, on the other side, we need to divide ourselves all the time. The cells in the gastrointestinal tract in our blood, they are dividing all the time. So, but they must divide under control. We don't want them to divide too fast. And they are dividing because of a group of proteins that are called growth-promoting proteins or oncogenic proteins. Now, you can imagine that if these proteins are underdegraded, they will push the cell to divide faster than they need. If you want an analogy to this equilibrium, so either over-degradation of tumor suppressor or under-degradation of oncogenic proteins that push the cell to divide will lead to cancer. So like everything in life, we need to be in the middle. We cannot deviate to the sides. What you can see here, you can imagine that you can see here a car. And the car is being driven normally by the driver. And the driver can control the car by both the brake and the gas. This is the gas that pushes the cells to, to divide. And this is the brake that tells the cells to stop once they have a mutation. It kills them. It stops the car from running. Now, if you drive a car, it's always a balance. You cannot drive a car that has only brakes, because the car will not go anywhere. It won't be a car. And you cannot drive a car that has only a gas pedal, because then you will not be able to stop even in the first traffic light, and you're going to die in an accident in the next few minutes, almost for sure. So the car needs a balance. So you can see that on the two sides of the equation, there is the brake and there is the gas. And we need to be um, in the middle. Now let's go to drugs. So once we understand that the system that destroys proteins here, either not functioning properly or functions too good, is involved in cancer or in Alzheimer, then the road is open to the next phase, and that's drug development. So we are moving very quickly from theory in the lab, from just in entertaining ourselves with biology and unraveling the secrets of nature and of creation, with practical human health. So here is a drug. And this drug was developed. It's an inhibitor. It was developed against one of the components of the system. I don't want to go. I did describe to you the system, so I'll skip this part. But it's a true drug. You see here, it's coming in a bottle. It's dissolved, and it's infused IV to patients. And the drug is a chemical. It's a boronic acid derivative. It's an aldehyde that has a structural, a chemistry, a simple aldehyde, I will not go into it, but it's a very effective inhibitor and more effective inhibitors are being developed. And this is a drug that is specific to one type of cancer. It's a one type of a leukemia called multiple myeloma. It's a, it's a cancer in which in the bone marrow of the patients, cells are multiplying in an uncontrolled manner and they occupy all the space of the bone marrow and they don't allow the bone marrow to function normally and to generate all the other blood elements. So it's a deadly disease. Until four years ago, it was a deadly disease. People died within two to three years in agony. It's a very painful disease because it's in the bone marrow, it's in the bones. So it presses against the long bones, against the vertebra. It's very cruel disease. The, seeing the suffering of this patient is really something that you don't see even on usual days in the hospital. So the drug was developed, it's called Valkyrie. And here you can see a patient, and patients are typically you don't show faces and you don't show names, but I will just give you an example again. You will understand it. This is the disease, it's a marker that is secreted by the disease, that the cells of the disease secrete, they generate some protein that we can identify, the immunoglobulin. So you see that the disease is galloping. The disease is progressing very rapidly. Here a treatment started of the patient with, with the chemotherapy, and the disease responds partially, and the disease erupts again. And here it started the treatment with the drug, and you can see that the disease goes away. 
I take it to another disease, and that's for you who were non Hodgkin lymphoma. We probably skipped it yesterday. So this is a, another disease of the lymph nodes of the immune system. And you can see here, again, I explained it to you, this is a computerized tomography of the chest. So it's a sophisticated, non-invasive methodology to look into uh, uh, patients. And you can see here, you can see this is a section, a cross section of the chest. You can see the rib. Here you can see the frontal sternum bone. You can see the vertebra. You can see the spinal canal. You can see the shoulder. So it's a cross section in this plane. And these black spaces here are the air in the lungs. So this is our lungs that we breathe air. And here you can see a tumor, a malignancy scene. Following treatment, you can see that the tumor is almost gone. So you can treat certain patients with this non Hodgkin lymphoma by inhibiting the ubiquitin system. Now, what you are doing by inhibiting the ubiquitin system, let's just understand it by going back to the brakes and the and the, and the gas. Let's go back to this one, and you'll understand it easily. If I inhibit the ubiquitin system, in this case, the tumor suppressors that are wrongly de degraded rapidly will now not be degraded. So the good proteins will come up again. So the car will gain in brakes. You remember I told you that the right side is the brake, the left side is the gas. So if there is no brakes, because the brakes are degraded by the, the, by the driver that abuses the car and presses the brakes all the time, by inhibiting the, the ubiquitin system, by not letting it degrade the brakes, the brakes will come up again and, excuse me, and will function properly, and therefore the patient will be better. So that's where the drug is acting. The drug is actually slows down the car by allowing the brakes to come up again. So I'll end up here by, by closing with a lesson again, because I think that the most important thing is not to learn the science, but to learn the lesson. And i close up with maybe one lesson, and that uh, a personal lesson, and that's uh, when the Nobel Prize was awarded to us in Sweden in the 10th of December of 2004, um, the Israeli ambassador to Stockholm gave us a party the Nobel Prize ceremony is not like an honorary doctorate that you come and go for one day, it's a 10 day celebration. So every day there is a, you are coming to Stockholm for 10 days, it's a very impressive uh, event, probably the most impressive event I've ever attended in my life. And uh, there was a party given to us by the Israeli ambassador, and during the party he said that somebody wants to talk to us, and this somebody was a patient. A Swedish patient they never met before and he came to the party and he came to tell us that he was dying of multiple myeloma until almost four or five weeks before the ceremony for the party and then the physicians in Stockholm decided to treat him with a drug the drug I don't know that it cured him but it put him into a long-term remission so he was free of the disease and from almost being dead he was walking on his feet, looking very healthy, he shook my hand strongly. I looked at him, he wasn't pale at all, so he was in a very good shape. And he came to thank us, and I said, why do you thank us? I didn't develop the drug. I mean, the drug was developed by a company. He said, yes, but without the knowledge of your discovery, the drug couldn't have been developed, which is a lesson in two ways. It's a lesson in science, that in science, we are part of a chain. We are a thin layer. You discover something and then somebody else takes it and further develops it and somebody else takes it and further develops it and further develops it until it becomes something useful for humanity and then people further improve it. So you don't need to do everything. But because we are one community and we can communicate over the internet and over the computers and by lectures and by libraries and by writing, there are numerous ways of communication. That's the beauty of the scientific community. That we talk one language, the medical and the scientific community. And it doesn't matter which religious we are, which sex we are, which nation we are, which language we talk. All these don't matter because we are dealing with the same very problem. So this was a very important lesson to me as a scientist, but also as a human being. I thought to myself that 
I deliberated at an early stage of my career what to do with myself. Shall I be a physician or shall I be a scientist? And then I ended up being a scientist, but nevertheless, I ended up being also a physician. So you can have impact on patients, not by directly treating them, but being involved in their science and their research that at the end lead to their cure. You don't have to be a practicing daily physician in order to have patients. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, lesson for me. The last comment that I want to make, people ask me from time to time, what is my dream? So I have a dream, but this dream is not achievable. There is no way that this dream can be achieved. And I tell you what is my dream. Because we are all involved in a developing society, obviously my dream is to continue my science, but that's I'm doing anyway, and being surrounded by a wonderful group of intelligent people and creative people and contributing to society, but that is not I have a very strange dream. And the strange dream is that there is nevertheless, at least for scientists, some default or some fallacy in the way God created us. He created us to live 70, 80, 90, 100 years in one chunk. But once you are in science, you become very fascinated because you realize that these 100 years or 90 years or 80 years of life are not sufficient, not only for yourself, but also to follow the development of science. So I want to see, for example, how cancer is being defeated. I want to see how Alzheimer is being defeated. I want to see how malaria and other infectious diseases are defeated. And I want to see how war and hatred are defeated. And I realized that this will not happen in my lifetime, or at least part of it will not happen in my lifetime, because God created me so that I was being born in 47, and I will die sometime, I don't know, within, from the next day to the next whatever, 20, 30 years. So I thought that, at least for scientists, if God would have been more thoughtful, he would have switched a little bit the way of creating people, and if you would have asked me what I would like to be like, to be like, I would have told him, listen, God, let me live for five years, and then kill me for the next 50 years, but then wake me up for another five years, so I will be able to follow what happened in the last five years for human beings, how many diseases, and then kill me again for 50 years, and wake me up for another five years. And let me live for 1,000 years and see how society is being changed. And if you think about it, you know, our society is changing extremely rapidly. Think about just the 20th century. What changes have occurred to us in the 20th century? We doubled the, the lifespan. In the beginning of the century, people lived only for 40 years. They died of infectious diseases. Think about antibiotics. Think about preventive medicine, about smoking, about cholesterol. Think about sanitation, about public health. Think about communication. Think about laser, about cellular phones. We, I, I didn't grow up on cellular phones. It's something new for me. It's only the last 10 years that I'm using a cellular phone. And I think it's a bad invention because it ties it up. I, don't, I hardly use a cellular phone. I don't want anybody to find me. But, uh, <laughs> but think about even the fax. The fax came and go. I mean, the faxes became almost useless with the internet. I mean, it was tragic. Think our life are changing. So, and think about the next, you know, what the next inventions are going to be. So, if any of you has any talk to God, tell him about my complaint. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to present to you a musical intermission number from the Pride of Angeles University Foundation, the AUF Performing Arts. Let's welcome them with a big hand. from the Broadway musical, Phantom of the Opera, with the songs, All I Ask of You, Think of Me, Angel of Music, and Music of the Night.
finale, here's a song that talks about the aspirations of the children in the modern world. Ladies and gentlemen, the AUF Performing Arts with their musical rendition of Vision of the Children.
We shall now have the academic exchange to be facilitated by Dr. Archimedes D. David, University Registrar. The academic exchange is now open for our questions for the good professor, Dr. Arnold J. Sikanova. We have roving ushers and usherettes uh, who will be giving us the microphones. Please identify yourself and the institution or higher education institution you represent. Thank you. Dr. Mangas from uh, the School of Medicine, I'm an ENT and a frustrated uh, scientist like you. <laughs> Anyhow, my question is about your uh, hypothesis of cancer and the equivalent system of, uh, I suppose, P53 degradation. Now, there is a system that when your uh, P53 is suppressed, deleted, or degraded, there is the natural killer cell system that, that activates either its uh, killer inhibitor receptor or the LI49, uh, looking at the MHC decrease in the cell membrane of your cancer cell. And whether your P53 is suppressed, degraded, or deleted, and for as long as the NK system is working, that cancer cell should not give rise and progress to clinical cancer. And from your uh, drug for uh, I suppose it works on both the, the degradation of your UPS, system, UPS and your NF-kappa-B uh, inhibition. So in both instances, you promote or uh, suppress protein uh, catabolism. Suppress that so your cancer will somehow go into a state where it does not lead to the killing of the host. So, in your laboratory, looking at bortezomib, did you look at the uh, function of your natural killer cells as an innate immune effector cell? The complicated one. <laughs> No, no, I, I was very serious about it, and I, and I really, I think that intentionally, I don't want to escape the answer, I think that I intentionally tried to float above rather than to go into details of NK, NK cell cells and the a detailed mechanism of bortezomib, of this drug. The, the, so I, I still would like to adhere to this, and I may tell you later, no, we didn't look into the function of NK cells. And in the lab, and we are not working particularly on the drug. All I can tell you what is known on the drug, that it affects the cells in many ways. One of the ways that you said right is NF-kappa B, because it inhibits the ubiquitin system, and therefore NF-kappa B is not activated. Uh, and NF-kappa B is a, is a factor that helps cells to survive as cancer cells. It's a survival factor. So once NF-kappa B is not there, the cells are dying more easily because of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. But again, I didn't want to go into all these details. Another way that it kills the cells, and therefore it's very specific drug to multiple myeloma and to non-Hodgkin lymphoma, to diseases of this type of the immune system, is because these cells are secreting antibodies. They are making lots of antibodies. I showed one of those as a biomarker for the disease, and uh, this some of the biomarkers are synthesized, uh, they are misfolded. And then the ubiquitin system that we discovered degrades them because they are synthesized rapidly. And some of them are like any, anything that you're doing on mass, you, you are making some mistakes. If you're making a thousand cars on a production line, one or two cars have to be disposed because they are not good. So it's a quality control. So if you kill the ubiquitin system, the ubiquitin system cannot function anymore on the quality control. And these misfolded proteins will induce apoptosis and will kill the cell. So you are using the ubiquitin system as an agent to accumulate abnormal proteins and to induce cell death. But again, I think that most of the audience, it's a very diverse audience, and I want to cater to most of them, so I didn't want to go into details, but during the recession, the reception, we can go into more details. But I intentionally avoided it, not that I don't like the science or the details. That's what I'm doing for my life, but I, I wanted it to be more popular. Uh, it's simply because we rarely get uh, an occasion like this where a Nobel laureate gets to visit a very small university. I realize it. And it, of course, 
when we go into details, this is something that we do, of course, in conventions abroad. This is the only place where we can do that. And that's why I brought this up. My point really is, we are looking at cancer at the initiation stage. And we know a lot about this. But the progression is something that nobody knows what is really causing cancer. And my last point is, if we can collaborate, AU and your laboratory, we can go into... Yeah, let, 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 let me, this I think was the more relevant part of your question. Uh, it's true, the Bridges said program doesn't mean to bring scientists from one university to, for two weeks. But I think that the idea in universities in general is the, 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 the intention of, the, of the, this wonderful organization is just to seek, to make an initiation, to start the process, and then it's up to the universities and to the researchers to take it from there. And so you are right. I'm here for a very short visit for half a day, and then I want also to enjoy the Philippines. Whenever people invite me and they ask, do you want us to pay you or some organization, I say, no, no, don't pay me, but take me around. I want to see the country. So today, we are going up to the north. We are going to Baguio and to Vigan to see a little bit more of the country. I cannot come to a country and say that I was in a hotel in Manila. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So, um, you are absolutely right. So, the answer is dual to your more broad quest. First, in general, I think that that's what we are doing in our universities and that's what our scientists are doing. That we are setting aside donations or whatever and we tell the donor that we are going to use this donation in order to bring scientists over for a longer period of time, for a week or two, to associate with the local scientists. So then you sit here, you talk to the graduate students, you look into the, into the graduate programs, and you become more associated, more intimately associated, rather than giving a ceremonial honorary doctorate. Not that this is not proper, but I mean, there are different ways to do different things. So you're absolutely right, and the university in general, not only in sciences, in physics, in chemistry, in engineering, in philosophy, in whatever you want. The idea is to set aside in my university, we are bringing scientists all the time. There, there is not a single week that a scientist will not come in any field to, to associate with the people. And we set aside a lot of money to bring them over. So that's in general. And yes, I mean, if the collaboration is relevant and it's something that we work on, I'm happy I was in Manidol University last year and a graduate student from Manidol is going to join my lab for uh, several months in coming April. Actually, I'm going to meet her next week probably. She will come to one of the events to finalize the arrangement. I was in China in Xi'an in the military medical school in the fourth or third military medical school. I don't remember the, the Chinese system, how they count the medical schools. And a Chinese student is going to come to my laboratory. So that's absolutely all possible. But you are right, I think that the idea is that this will not remain at the ceremonial level, but rather will have deeper and long-term impact. I agree with you completely. Thank you, sir. from the Center for Planning, Research, and Development. Uh, your lecture was uh, indeed uh, very enlightening for us researchers. Uh, we, we are inspired to continue with our medicinal, uh, collaborative uh, medicinal research because of your lecture. Sir, my question is like this. Uh, your lecture is about ubiquitin mediated protein degradation, right? Now, uh, you have mentioned the role of ubiquitin in the degradation of cancer cells. My question, uh, upon seeing your transparency or your, your presentation, I was able to see those uh, enzymes, three enzymes involved in the degradation of your proteins. They were involved in the initiation or act activation of the ubiquitin and the recognition and uh, release of the cancer cells. Now my question is, have you already, sir, um, identified, structurally elucidated those enzymes? Because I believe, although you have already isolated and identified ubiquitin, these three enzymes are already also very important for the release of these cancer cells. Yeah, the answer is yes. This was part of our original work. We identified all the enzymes, the principal enzymes, and we elucidated the mechanism of action. But we identified only one set, and it turned out, following the uh, unraveling of the human genome, that those enzymes are not one, two, three. But number three, for example, has 
thousand different enzymes. So the ubiquity ligase, which is number three, we didn't predict that there would be thousands, and there was no way in the world that we could have discovered it. So we discovered the cascading principle. So exactly to your answer, yes, we know how ubiquitin is activated, how it's going from E1 to E2 to E3, and from E3 to the substrate. So we identified all the cascade and the principal action, but then the details have been worked out in two decades of work, not by us, but by hundreds of researchers all over the world. And the ultimate came at the beginning of the current uh, millennium of the 21st century, when the human genome was unraveled, and then by a common structural motif in a bioinformatics database, it, people were able to identify the entire family of 1,000 ligases and 50 ubiquitin carrier proteins and E1 and all the subunits of the proteasome. All together, without going into too many details, the ubiquitin system contains almost 1,500 components. It's a huge system, very cumbersome, much more complex than we even understand. We don't understand even the tip of the iceberg of the ubiquitin system that we discovered. It's only now, via bioinformatics and proteomics and structural biology, and identification of the three-dimensional structure, the people start to have a glimpse at the ubiquitin system. So we are at the very beginning. Uh, I understand, sir, because I also I have also worked on isolation, and it took me several years, several years to isolate a compound from a bioactive component. Thank you, sir. It's an over. Uh, the Center of Cladding Research and Development. Uh, in recent years, several ubiquitin-like proteins uh, have already been discovered. Several uh, ubiquitin-like proteins, right, uh, that can modify other cellular proteins in a manner that is analogous uh, to the ubiquitin of uh, that has been discovered uh, in that system. Is it possible that could these ubiquitin-like proteins can also compete or even interfere uh, for the same residue, like for example, lysate residues in target proteins? Well, again, it's a highly professional targeted question. And the field really, again, the, the ubiquitin system has exploded. I mean, truly exploded. And I really, again, try to float on the very thin layer and on top of it, taking the pilot view of 30,000 feet. Um, true, many proteins were discovered that I called UBLs, or ubiquitin-like proteins, but not only ubiquitin-like proteins. There are proteins that have ubiquitin interacting motifs. They are called the UIMs. And there are proteins that, have, that are called UBAS, or ubiquitin-associated motifs. And there are ubiquitin interacting proteins. It's a whole big family of proteins that told us that modification by ubiquitin is not limited to proteolysis, but, ubiquitin, but, but modification by ubiquitin-like protein like SUMO, for example, it's called small ubiquitin modifier, it's not the big Japanese uh, warrior, and serve many what we call non-proteolytic functions. So this is one complexity. And uh, another complexity was discovered with ubiquitin itself, that the chains of ubiquitin are not identical and they are using different internalizing residues to make different chains that serve different uh, purposes. Briefly, all I can tell you, again using a metaphoric language, that if about seven or eight years ago, people would have asked me what's ubiquitin, I would have told him or her that ubiquitin is a proteolytic marker. If you ask me today what's ubiquitin or ubiquitin-like protein, I will tell you that it's a passport. Now, what is a passport? A passport is a document that allows you to enter countries. So, ubiquitin is a passport, basically. And if you have ubiquitin chain that is based on lysine 48 internal residues, again, without going, it allows you to go to the protosome to be degraded. If it uh, sumo on a certain protein, it will allow you to go to the nuclear pore complex protein run uh, get BT. If it's a, uh, uh, ubiquitin nation on lysine 63 on, on uh, RIP on ORNIC, it will activate NF kappa B signalosome pathway. So it's kind of a, a change that 
that talks different languages. So it's basically a, a set of passports that allow you to enter different countries. It's basically, I would say, not a passport, now that I think about it, but it's a visa. Passport is one document, but visa is issued by each country. So my passport, for example, that is very thick and full with stamps, has many visas in it for countries that still require visas. I mean, not every country requires visa. Some countries are more trustworthy or trusting than others. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a visa that allows you to enter different countries. So ubiquitin has really exploded, the ubiquitin field in the last several years, not only by ubiquitin light proteins, but also by ubiquitin itself. There is mono ubiquitination and oligo ubiquitination and poly ubiquitination, and it can go to different lysins. And they serve many, many different functions. So I hope that I, again, answered your questions very superficially, because each of those questions really reflects deep knowledge of the field and deserves much more than I pay attention to in this kind of a format, and I apologize for being that superficial. Dr. Uh, I'm Dr. Ray Spirito from Catalyst University. I came across an article where biomolecular biochemists discovered a new kind of a protein that interprets, no, RNA, interprets RNA. Are you familiar with this, interprets RNA? That uh, got the Nobel Prize about uh, a year ago by uh, Andrew Fire and Craig Mello. It's a very sophisticated system by which uh, you can destroy specifically RNAs in cells using a whole system that they discovered that is called the Dicer and, and many other components. Uh, Craig Mello is from the University of Massachusetts in Worcester and Andrew Fire is from Stanford. And it's a very promising system as far as drug discovery because you may be able to destroy bad proteins. You don't have to destroy them by the ubiquitin system. You may be able to destroy the RNA to prevent their formation. But it's so far, unlike the ubiquitin system, hasn't advanced that far. And there is still no drug. There is still a problem in expressing the interference RNA in cells. So it has a promise, but the promise has not been fulfilled clinically yet. I mean, the system is a very useful system, very sophisticated system being used in the laboratory, in my laboratory, we use it all the time in order to silence genes. So it's a, it's a, system, it's a very effective system to silence genes, and I'm sure uh, that it will be fine, many uses in cancers as well. But it got a lot of recognition, including the highest recognition of the Nobel Committee in Medicine, when in 2000, when was it? Five or six, I think, Mellow and Fire got the Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine. We thank very much the good professor for the clarification she has given to our questions. We thank also the audience for their questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just completed the investiture ceremonies and the lecture program. May we request everybody to please rise for the singing of the university hymn.
afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank you very much for your presence. We shall now have the recessional.